Um, hello. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about a, a particular commission um, that was probably one of the most challenging uh, commissions that I've done to date, but probably the most rewarding. It was the most sort of fraught and complex that I've sort of had to uh, sort of um, sort of uh, work on. But it was also, I don't know, it took me very much outside of my normal comfort zone, and it's sort of a place actually that I really enjoy being being taken is sort of really being pushed to to sort of really sort of extreme sort of. Uh, uh, sort of places with, with the work and, and ideas and, and problem solving. Um, before I start talking about that, I thought I'd just give some context to some other pieces in my practice, but particularly in the public realm, but that which have all been very much um, inspired partly by the space in which they have been conceived for. So they're not just standalone objects that are sorry, I need to. They're not just they're not just standalone objects that have, have just been dreamed up for a white white cube. Um, this is a piece called Dappled Light of the Sun, which was um, built for the Royal Academy Courtyard last summer. And it consists of uh, 24,000 triangles, um, 6,000 uh, 6, uh, tetrahedrons, which all bolt together to form these bifurcating patterns. And they're all arranged on these stilts above, so you can walk underneath. It was very much about approach and guiding yourself underneath them. And, um, in, and actually, it, it, in terms of um, tessellation, which was touched upon earlier in, a, in another lecture, the, the, um, the tetrahedron is the, is the simplest of the platonic solids, but it's, it doesn't tessellate with itself. So unlike the cube or the, uh, the truncated octahedron, um, it, it forms these sort of irrational bifurcating tendrils that sort of bifurcate and grow out. And it's almost like, like plant-like structures that grow. Um, this piece was, so this is, the piece is called the dappled light of the sun because it refers to the, to the passage of light through it. So it sort of tries to emulate the, um, the idea of that, un that universal experience of us all being under a tree in the summertime and having that beautiful sort of serene sort of perfect moment of, of the light sort of touching the ground through the leaves and, and that sort of wonder or that serenity. Um, but obviously in a very industrial sort of man-made way, but hopefully for achieving that kind of natural uh, environment, that natural sort of a, a, a feeling as well. The, the piece was sort of, it was, while it was conceived for this courtyard, it was very much, I was trying to create this, this, uh, this opposition between the materials of the, the, the stone facade, the classical stone facades, and then this organic, quite hardcore material in the center. Um, you can see the shadows here on the ground. Um, it was then taken to other places, and I was really worried about it in, in another context that it hadn't been conceived for, and this is in this very Arcadian Chatsworth house, where it was later in, in the September that summer, it went to there, there's three of them. So it was this very Arcadian setting, but actually I was kind of, it sort of took on, because you had suddenly had the horizon in there, it took on this cloud-like forms. It was almost like clouds floating, and almost the stilts were not like uh, holding it up, but it's almost tethering it down. Um, and then similarly, it was in Regent's Park, one of them was in Regent's Park in October as part of the art fair, the Freeze Art Fair. Um, and again, I was really worried that it wouldn't just, wouldn't compete with, um, it would compete and fail against the trees and against nature. Um, but actually, I think what I was sort of pleasantly surprised that it seemed to sort of hold its own against the, against the sort of shrubs and the trees. And in this autumnal kind of uh, light, in this autumnal time of year, it sort of seemed to complement the sort of change of the colours of the leaves and, and hopefully stand its own against the natural environment. Um, this is a piece that you may have seen if you were walking here. I, I'm very sort of excited. We just installed this um, a couple of weeks ago. It's outside the Francis Crick Centre on Midland Road, just around the corner from here. So if you're walking back to Euston, you can go around the western side of St. Pancras and see it. It's, a, it's again, it uses the tetrahedron as its, sort of, as its rule. And I often create a lot of constraint for myself in the rules that I create for the, for the generation of the work. So with the, with, the, with the dappled light of the sun, it was all about the tetrahedron. I had to, I had to use this dogma, this brick, as my building block. And, it would, um, and with this one, it's basically a stack of tetrahedrons or tetroids that get slightly bigger each time and it spirals up, and the base is only 90 centimeters, and the top is seven meters. So it's a very precarious stack. And this piece really owes its inspiration to, again, it was a competition, and I was very much responding to the, the endeavor of this building. This, this is a biomedical lab. It's basically kind of, we're trying to sort of um, think in new ways about sort of solving kind of issues within, within drug research and within cancer, and how they can try and sort of concertina the time it takes from drugs to being invented to hitting the shelves. And, so this piece is kind of called Paradigm after the sort of scientist, um, the, his, the, the his philosophical scientist called um, Thomas Kuhn, who um, um, coined the phrase paradigm shift in which um, healthy science has to topple old paradigms in order for new ideas to, to emerge. 
Um, so there you can see it with the context of King's Cross. And it, indeed, if you were to add another tetrahedron to the top of this, if your argument was to grow stronger or more mighty, the whole thing would collapse. So this is, it's, the materials are working really, really hard. It's, there's 28 tons of core 10 there. So it's, a, it's quite a, and it's, a, it's a really, and it is a true, it is truthful to itself. It is a stack of tetrahedrons that literally bolt together. And there it is with the, in front. Um, this is one of my first, my first ever sort of um, pieces that I made as, a, as an indoor public piece, but it was the first time I had to think of something not just in a show for, that someone would see for half an hour. So it was the first time I had to really engage with the fact that this was going to be there for 20 years or longer, and everyone would have to engage every day with it. And they wanted something moving, and so this piece, you can see these two shots in different positions. Every midday it moves to a new position, and it stays there. So at your desk, when you're looking at the piece, it has, you have this different dynamic relationship with it, and it never repeats, it just sort of moves randomly on two axes. So you kind of have this constant flux and change in the morning and the afternoon. Um, and this was all made of oak, and I used to make a lot of things out of wood. And so this was all made of oak and um, plywood. Um, this is a piece in Dulwich Park that we just installed last year. It's a, called Three Perpetual Chords, and it's a kind of complete opposite of the, the piece outside the Francis Crick Institute, which was this kind of civic sculpture that's unclimbable and sort of this totemic object. These are very much about uh, approach and, and uh, play and tactility, you get immersement. They were replacing a, a Barbara Hepsworth sculpture that was stolen for scrap metal a few years before, and they had this competition. And so there was a sort of nod to Barbara Hepworth in the sense that they're, they were, so they're basically diagrams of holes and they were these sort of immersive forms. I think Barbara Hepworth was very, sort of the thing that she didn't, she's not accredited enough for is this idea of journey, sort of entering into an object. So these pieces are very much about sort of entering into them and sitting inside them, uh, yeah, just kind of owning them and, and playing inside them. Um, and then this, is a, well, this was a really, um, a piece I'm very proud of that was at the Camden Roundhouse in 2013 um, in London. Um, you can see it's, it's very dark at the bottom there, but you've got this gnomon, this sort of sh shadow maker that's making this triple shadow. And essentially, this piece was inspired by this space, and, and I was really sort of searching for a piece that would work in this big, dark, cavernous space. And I counted the columns in the room, and there were 24 columns in the space, and it sort of, sort of kept, got me started on a journey about the number 24 and the history of 24. And I looked at Mayan and Egyptian and Greek, ancient Greek calendars and all the reasons why we have 360, and we have 360 degrees, why we have 12 for the months of the year. But there was no real reason why there was 24 hours in a day, not why weren't there 36 hours, or why wasn't there? And so it was just sort of an interesting thing. I sort of turned this, I turned the clock back into a celestial sort of experience by putting these triple arms on it, which basically used the, the common denominators of 12, so three and six and four and two, to basically create these pulsing moments. So you have these moments of coalition and, and diversion. And at, at 12 o'clock, the, the three lights line up perfectly um, uh, vertically, and you have this sort of moment of alignment of the shadows. So it's sort of turning the clock back into a celestial experience that it once was maybe for all of us when we were primeval nomadic farmers before we had number and, and hierarchies of number. So this is the piece that I want to sort of follow on to. This is called the, the Optic Cloak, and it's sort of only recently been given a title. Um, I was approached a few years ago to, to enter a public competition to solve a quite a complicated problem. Um, and it was... Essentially, this was the way that the proposal was pre presented to me. It was this very tall, 15-meter-high tower, which basically was hiding inside it nine chimneys. And this is a low-carbon energy center that they were design designing in, in Greenwich Peninsula, which is um, basically there's a big development down there, to, to, and they wanted to create a sort of very efficient way of heating all the homes. There was going to be 10,000 homes there, and they wanted to save energy and do something kind of that was attempting to be green and sort of trying to sort of save carbon. Um, but there was a sort of a bit, it was a bit problematic because this originally had been sort of these naked chimneys rising up and then the council had sort of said that actually we can't have these on the horizon so you've got to cover them up. And so then there was 600 tons of steel were put around these chimneys which seems slightly when you're trying to save carbon didn't seem completely the right, um, obviously seemed a bit depressing to do that when you're trying to really sort of be very efficient. Um, and then they, they sort of it was, and then it was clad in this sort of grey, but it was basically a sort of a bit of a problem. And so then there was this competition for an artist to put an object on the side of it or turn it into something that made it look not like a chimney. So it was sort of slightly maybe disingenuous, like let's pretend it's an artwork, not a chimney. But um, so, but I was sort of 
reading this, and I've, one of the, my sort of anxieties was it was like, well, I can't. Uh, looking at this sort of stream of events, it's sort of we're all a bit screwed if, we, if I add another big object to the side of this chimney when we're trying to save a bit of carbon. So I was sort of thinking, I've got to do something that's going to make this thing lighter. And I think some of the other proposals were adding things to it or turning it into a big screen on the side, which is going to use electricity. So the rules I set myself was like, no electricity to, to power something all the time, and, uh, and I've got to make this lighter. So we sort of set about, and I was really interested in this idea of camouflage and this idea of disingenuousness and something pretending to be something else, hence this title, Cloak. And so I was looking at, I went back and looking, was looking at dazzle camouflage and all of the ways that objects pretend to be another object, but at the same time, this paradox between an object, a, a, a camouflage object at one, at one moment is very visible, but on the other hand, it disappears against something else. So there's this sort of kind of, there's this sort of the dual thing where something becomes more arresting and yet somehow disappears. So we're looking at all these sort of amazing kind of First World War ships that, that sort of seemed extraordinarily kind of counterintuitive that why you would make this sort of, this incredibly zebra pattern. But somehow when you're looking through the periscope, it sort of breaks up the form and it's all related to, to sort of cubism and sort of, um, I was looking at David Bomberg and sort of artists like this, how a form gets broken up because I wanted to try and sort of create a sort of tiling system for the tower somehow that would break it up against the horizon. So it was sort of became a beautiful thing, but at the same time was beguiling and, and the surface was disrupted. So these are another David Bomberg there. Um, so these are just some early sketches just on the backs of envelopes that was sort of looking at, and I just really was actually, it was a really analog thing. So we've been talking a lot about technology today and things, but actually this is a, the, the, the process here, even though it's very, we use a lot of computer in the work. The, this thing that actually just came out from folding paper and just doing like pleated folds in a piece of square paper. And so this was a sort of original idea of just putting the whole thing, uh, just kind of pleating a sort of uh, aluminium all over the surface. It was a sort of real early study to see how you could do it. And, and instead of using color, just using sort of sculptural form to create light and shade over the surface. Um, the other thing is that the building is really because it has this opportunity of this sort of, it's like this blade or this slab coming out of the ground and it faced it east to west. There was this, obviously the orientation of the sun around it would, one side in the morning would be dark and in the evening the other side would be lit. And you'd have this sort of thing where it would be, kind of have this kind of quite dramatic night and dark, light and shade on it. And then in the midday you'd get a kind of side angle of light hitting it from the south. So it was sort of that, I was interested in that. It was a very sort of unique, um, so this is just sort of further, further up. So seeing that, just creating that, that kind of um, enhanced sculptural thing just because of the fact that it was kind of uh, a big object in the sun. And this is so, this would be from the other side. And I think it was also, look, I was looking at the, uh, the history of spires and the history of towers and what their purpose was in, in the Middle Ages and things. And I suppose towers were, of course, churches were built as a homage to God and sort of to try and reach the heavens. But they were also, they obviously, um, they obviously, from a distance, they, they signify the center of a village. But I think one of the more, the more useful towers are not the cylindrical ones or the symmetrical ones, but the towers that not only show you where you are in relation, that how far you are from the center, but also show you where you are in relation to the center. So, like, for example, the Swiss rebuilding, the Gherkin, isn't very, it, you know where you are, how far away you are from it, but from every single angle, it's the same. Whereas something like the Twin Towers in New York, you did know how far east or west you were because of this asymmetry to them. And so this, has, this, this, this tower here has the potential to tell you where you are in relation to it, not just how far you are away from it. And I think that's something that maybe is not so, has been a bit lost in, in contemporary architecture, that idea of orientation around, around a tower. So again, more kind of experiments with this folded um, pattern. I wasn't, I wasn't sort of there yet, and I was sort of thinking of how we could sort of make it lighter and also save weight and things, and it had this big steel frame inside it, and we were still sort of looking at that, and I was looking at how we could light it at night, um, and I was looking at making the whole thing out of like, like some sort of plastic material so you could see through it. And then I was sort of doing more research into, oh, sorry. So this is, the, this is a study in the studio that we've just completed, so you can see this sort of bold sort of aluminum face, how it's sort of this quite bold kind of structural, sort of um, sculptural sort of surface. And, uh, but it still wasn't kind of enough for me. It didn't feel like it was sort of doing enough in terms of that sort of surface. So there's this idea of further disrupting that surface. So I was looking at things like the Moray effect, this idea of interference patterns. So it struck me that the, the surface, the back and the front were so close together 
that there was a real opportunity to create an interference pattern between the front face and the back face of this tower. And so we were looking at different optic effects and why they happened, and so things like this just... And the fact that people would be driving past this thing on the motorway, you'd have all this movement, so you don't need to make the sculpture move, you just get everyone to move around it, people walking or people driving past. And I was looking at this, the phenomena of this effect in architecture around, and, just, and so we just set about trying to find the sweet spots of this phenomenon. Um, so this is quite a really sort of early moment where I sort of, we just got two panels of mesh, and we just filmed it from 50 meters away with a zoom. And you couldn't see the holes in this mesh from the distance, but they're like one mil holes, but somehow it amplified the effect depending on the angle, the distance they were apart, there were all these different parameters that were just very, very sensitive to exploitation. And so we just sort of set, sort of quite scientifically, set about researching this sort of, this optic phenomenon. And so this is some distance and hole size or distance, and there's a really strange thing when you move away, it has the illusion of the of the sort of the, the movement, there's an illusion of the movement going perpendicular to your movement away. There's almost like this, this right angle triangle thing going on where you sort of have this, and then the other one moves in, in the, to the left. So there's all these sort of weird sort of optic phenomenons. And, it, and it's interesting because it was re replicatable on a computer as it is for the eye. So it's not just an, a brain illusion thing. It's, it's a mathematical phenomenon. Um, so this is... Um, different opacities in mesh, so we're kind of looking at the, now we've taken the pleated pattern, and we were just looking at how it affects just, if you have bigger holes, less, less material, basically, because I was still trying to lighten it up, and if I could put holes in the tower, I could also lighten the frame, and so we could make everything like, so it all kind of feed onto itself. So this is uh, like 46%, and that's 35%, so it just, and actually the, the denser one was actually more effective, and then just putting it on a background color, just the slight orientation change of these pleated tiles, would create a completely different, almost like a tiger skin sort of effect. So you're kind of getting this sort of weird sort of camouflage effect appearing. Um, so this is the front face. So you imagine the sun's hitting this from the front. But then as you peel back around the side, um, you start to realize that this, because the sun is reflecting off that, so you don't have the um, silhouette. But as you, as you scroll around it, you then realize that this thing is, is, um, is semi-transparent. And it's very sensitive, so just the slightest movement creates this sort of complete um, kind of very radical movement on the, on the surface. So that idea of even if you're just walking in the street and you just move from side to side and the sun's behind it, you're going to get this very, um, a very um, sort of uh, potent effect. And so this is a sort of two meter model in the studio. Um, this one actually is, the, the mesh is one mil thick, so actually if we scale this up, the mesh would be 25 mil thick, so it's actually much more dense than the, the one will be in the, in the real life. Um, so these are just some still shots just showing all the difference of um, the patchwork of effects getting from just angle, orientation, just light, and then the light and shade hitting it. Um, and then this is the pan of the actual tower. So this, I don't, this piece is really important for me. This piece isn't, isn't, isn't an artwork. It isn't a sculptor, sculpture. Sorry. It's, uh, this, is a, this is an artistic response to a, to a problem. The piece in my studio, could, I could argue, is a sculpture because it doesn't have a load of flues inside it, it doesn't have staircases, it doesn't have door, fire exits, and all that, and cranes on the top. This is subservient to a lot of stuff that this thing needs to primarily function as an as a industrial piece of equipment. But this is, so they're all, there are a lot of compromises in it that have had to happen because of the fact that primarily it's a chimney, a flue. And this is, oh, sorry. So this is um, the next one, if we play. Yeah, so this is, again, another slow pan of the whole thing. Um, I mean, the nice thing at the beginning is there won't, be, there won't be nine chimneys inside it. There'll only be three or four, so it'll be quite open to begin with. Um, but we, the, the radical thing about this was that, that we, we came along and this building was already designed, and actually there was, um, there was some really very courageous sort of commissioners with it who really sort of took on board the idea and were really enthusiastic about it. And we had to completely redesign the primary frame and the skin, and, an architect had already designed all this, so there's a lot of sort of there's a lot of sort of commotion happening around it. But actually, one of the one of the really gratifying things about it is that we, since we came along to the beginning, we've um, the, the original scheme which I was presented for this this 600 ton thing with this plastic skin on it was 
this is up to this this particular version, this this new incarnation, which is going up now in, in Greenwich as we speak, is um, up to 40% lighter than the um, than the original scheme. So we've actually made this thing much more. We, I, hopefully, we can really put our hand on our heart and say that it's a much more green building than it was. At, at night, the idea is to use really low energy lights to create, like with the space trumpet you saw at the beginning, just a series of static compositions, almost like a cubist painting, that um, basically goes on from, from dusk till midnight. And so you, when you're sitting, if you're doing the washing up or you're sitting by this, out, looking out the window, you'll see this sort of this montage out of your window that will change every night. And so there'll be this sort of um, slow, sort of slow, slow um, kind of flux of, of a sort of moving carousel of, 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 of a sort of static. It's not going to have that sort of green LEDs and big changing lights all the time. It's just going to be static, subtle, illuminated from within itself. And then this is the render of it, yeah, next to the A12. So you'll get a pan around it, and you'll sort of zoom past it, and you'll get all this strange flicker. So hopefully it'll be quite beguiling. It'll catch you in the corner of the eye, and you'll have this slightly strange. So they're all the different demographics. So the people coming by car, or the people living in the peninsula, hopefully everyone will have a slightly different experience of it. Um, then yeah, against the against the skyline there, um, and as you see, it's all I'm a, I use a lot of triangles. You can see that I'm sort of quite into my triangles. And then just finally, I was just going to finish on a very different piece because I've shown you lots of pieces that are really about how space and parameters affect my work. But this is a piece called Slow Arc Inside a Cube, which is sort of almost at the antithesis of that. This is a piece that you put inside a room, and the room changes. It sort of affect the room is subservient to the piece rather than the other way around. And I thought I'd end on this because it's sort of quite a, quite a sort of a piece close to my heart. There's basically this, you get this projection of this perfect warped cube with this rhombic mesh and the lights kiss in the middle and you get a single shadow. And the idea is if, if you were to, if you could only see the walls of this, of this space and you couldn't see the object, the real thing, the platonic object in the middle, could you ever get back to that object if you could only infer it from the walls and the shadows of the walls? So it's like a sort of Plato cave kind of analogy. And I think that's the sort of, um, that really sums up the sort of position of, of the artist or of the scientist or of, of, or of just the human in general, that we're all trying to see beyond the perceptive box that we're inside. And it's just how we go about doing that that is the sort of question. And that's sort of, I guess, what makes us human. Great. Thank you.